you know, one of the things about um, university life is that you begin to learn how professors teach, how individual professors teach and grade and exam. And so you get to get a sense for, okay, if this information was presented like this in class, and this is how it's going to appear on the exam, this is how hard I need to study, and so on. It's as if they're becoming calibrated. Well, we were trying to replicate that in this experiment. So five times they did the Swahili English word pairs, they got feedback, and uh, they saw how many they predicted, then how many they actually got right. The findings were fascinating. The top 25%, the people that did the best on the SAT uh, test, they started out more calibrated, their predictions were closer to their actual performance, and they quickly became perfect. So if they said that they were going to get 14 right, they got 14 right. The bottom 25%, they started out way overconfident, and even after four or five times of telling them, you said you'd get this many right, and you only got this many right, they were still overconfident. And it turns out that that is a good predictor of how well a student does. Now, this was published for the first time in 2007, but it's something all professors know about. I've had a dozen conversations with professors about this topic, and they, they all know about it. When they see a student come into their office, and the student says, oh, I did terrible on the exam. That's okay. That, I mean, you don't want to do terrible, but that's good. You're talking to the professor. But the next question often is, how did you think you would do? You got a D. What did you think your grade was going to be? Now, if they say an A, uh, almost invariably the professors are concerned. I'm concerned after this research because that shows me that they're not calibrated and that research we conducted shows me that um, particularly if they have a, a, a below average IQ or below average relative to their classmates, they're less likely to become calibrated. Now if they come in and say, I got a D, and I say, well, how'd you think you were going to do? Uh, I didn't really study that well. I was kind of expecting a C or D. That's good because now they're calibrated. They knew that they didn't know the information. And this turns out to be an important variable uh, in uh, improving memory. So when you overlearn it, back to suggestion number nine, be honest with yourself. At some point, you know you're going to know it in a couple of weeks and then move on. Related to what we were just talking about, monitor yourself. Whenever possible, try to monitor your learning. Do you know what's necessary uh, for the assignment? Do you know what's necessary for the exam? Do you know what's necessary for the class? A couple of ways to do this. The quizzes. Um, in my classes, I try to give pop quizzes just for the purpose of allowing people to uh, monitor themselves. Uh, the quizzes at the end of the book, I think a lot of students won't use those. But that's a great way to monitor how well you're learning the information. If you can't answer the quizzes at the end of the chapter, uh, 10 quiz question, uh, questionnaire at the end of the chapter, then you probably haven't learned it well enough. Flashcards can be helpful for this. Um, if you have the flashcards and you know the information, pull it out um, and only study the flashcards that you still need more time with. Pay attention to how well you're concentrating. Uh, monitor your attention levels. Monitor your reading. Are you learning the information in the textbook? This is easier said than done. I'm going to have a suggestion in a moment as to how to do that. But while we're reading, it's a very important task. Are you learning the information? Now, sometimes it's obvious you're not. I'm sure you've had those situations where you're reading the, the textbook and your mind just goes someplace else. You start imagining what you're going to do this weekend or whatnot. And you, it's odd. You can say every word you know, on, say, a page of the textbook. You say every word in your head, but your mind really is elsewhere. And you kind of snap out of it. You say, wow, OK, um, I certainly need to reread that whole thing. But it's not always that obvious. Sometimes we're just trying to get to the end of the chapter. I call this the, uh, the finger reading method, where your finger's at the end of the chapter, and you're going nine more pages, uh, seven more pages, five more pages, just trying to get to the end. That strategy, I understand why students are doing that. They're trying to meet their goal in terms of what they need to read. But many times, they're not actually learning what they need to learn at the end. It's better to set it down. Go do something else. I mean, you're wasting your time once you get that fatigued. So monitor the reading, monitor your attention in the lectures, and monitor your fatigue. Number 11 of the 24 ways is to distribute practice over time rather than massing it. This is an old principle in memory research where if you only have, uh, say, two hours to study something, 
you'd much rather distribute that two hours over a week, uh, say uh, 15 minutes a day uh, for, for a week or eight days, rather than spending um, all two hours at one time in one sitting. Uh, we first learned this in the uh, uh, sports psychology uh, research area, where if you had, say, two hours to do free throws, you don't want to do all your free throw practicing at one time for two hours. It would be much better to take that and split it up over the week. So distribute your practice rather than massing it. We talked about that, uh, some strategies at the beginning of this lecture, how you can facilitate that, but it's a very important principle. Number 12. This is probably not a suggestion you've ever heard before, but I believe that highlighters should be illegal. Do not use highlighters. Particularly, do not use highlighters for textbook material where you're learning new material. Why? Well, how, what do you do when you, do a, when you have a highlighter? First of all, you do the right part. You recognize that something is important. That's actually half the battle, knowing what's important, what's not important. But if you're using a highlighter, then you have recognized what is important. Maybe a paragraph, oh, that's important. They were talking about that in class. They said this might be on the exam. Um, this is kind of hard. I don't quite understand that, but this is important. So I'm going to highlight it, and that's going to help me remember it. As if there's a magical conduit between your fingertips and the hippocampus, the part of the brain where you make new memories. No. Highlighting is not going to help make a new memory. And actually, it might do the opposite. Because what happens when you highlight? You recognize that it's important, you highlight it, and then you say, ah, now I have it. Now I'll be able to remember it. Well, if you're honest, you know that you don't know it at that point. But if I was to ask you, well, why did you just highlight it? Why are you moving on without making a new memory? You'd say, well, I'm going to come back and study it later. That doesn't make any sense. It'll be out of context. And one of the things that students need to learn is that professors usually don't force you to remember a list of facts. It seems like it. It seems like you're being asked to, to remember a list of facts. It's not how we're teaching, though. In our minds, we're teaching examples um, of, a, of a larger picture, a bigger picture idea. What's the context? And the facts are in that context, but it's that bigger picture context. And many students, particularly the C and D students, they, I find that they don't recognize the context. I mean, why are we learning these facts? If I ask them, the D student, why, why did we learn these facts? They often don't know. Now, the A student will say, well, these facts are a part of this bigger picture, and that's why we're talking about them. So, what happens with the highlighting is, even if you go back and memorize that paragraph that was highlighted, it's out of context. The pages before it that set up the context, the pages after it that further refine the context are all gone. You're not going to read all that information. And so the person is trying to learn, wrote learn, I might add, that information in isolation. That's a problem. That actually goes against my number two suggestion of trying to encode it in more than one way. You know, if you don't have the context, it's just, it's, it's isolated. And you probably only have one pathway into that. Literally, it might only be one pathway of neurons into that um, information. And we're not likely to remember it. So, what to do? Now, and I have to admit, I have a highlighter in my office, but I'm more highlighting um, things like in a journal article that I'm going to come back to and um, paraphrase and put into a paper. Um, I mean, that type of highlighting, or highlighting something to grab my attention later, not highlighting to make a new memory. Number 13, this is what you do. 13 is to take notes on reading in your own words. Don't just write them down verbatim. This, of all 24 strategies, will improve your grades more than anything else. Matter of fact, I will guarantee if you're a C student, and you're taking classes where there's a lot of textbook reading, and you're not doing this, taking notes on your own reading, you will turn into an A student once you start doing so, at least for that textbook material. Take notes on your own reading in your own words. Don't write it down verbatim. This is another suggestion that my memory mentor uh, told me to do, and I started doing it every day at that place in the library where I studied almost every night, uh, seven days a week. 
is I wouldn't use a highlighter. I would read a passage, might be a page, might be two, it might be three pages, kind of depending on, on how it's presented, but kind of a coherent, uh, um, uh, cohesive passage. And then, in my own words, I would try to write a short paragraph paraphrasing it. And it was hard. It was really hard. And one of the things that my mentor said was he said, you can't do it verbatim. You can't write exactly what the author wrote. And I thought about it. I mean, every time I thought about that, the, the, what I used to often think was that it just didn't make sense. I mean, that person knows it better than anybody else. They wrote it perfectly. But if I just copy that, that is not deep processing. That is not elaborative rehearsal. That's maintenance rehearsal, just repeating it in your head and letting go of it. That will not help make a memory. But you read that, and then you try to summarize it and paraphrase that. Now, it does a couple of things. First of all, it makes you process the information at a deep level. Secondly, it forces you to monitor how well you're learning the information. You know, if you cannot paraphrase a two-page passage, you don't know it well enough. And it kind of forces you to go back. Uh, and many times you, you think you do know it well enough because, you know, it makes sense. Yeah, 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 that all makes sense. But then you go to try to uh, reproduce that or paraphrase that, and you can't do it. And that shows you haven't learned it at a deep enough level. Thirdly, when you're studying, it makes sense. Now, if you've ever tried this, if you ever tried this, and then you've also have used the highlighter method, it's a night and day difference. When you go back to the highlighter method, and you go and you read that passage that you've highlight, you highlighted, you got to be honest, it doesn't really help that much. When you think about it, you're like, I still don't completely understand it. And if you've ever got an essay on that part of the reading, you probably didn't do too well on it. But when you do the paraphrasing method, you'll be surprised. You look at your notes, it makes sense. You wrote them. And you will be able to write an elaborative essay on it. You'll know the information much better. So it's much more challenging, but much, much more effective. Take notes on reading in your own words. Number 13, take a C student, maybe even a D student, and turn them into an A student. Number 14. Make associations with the new material and things you already know. This is kind of like the second suggestion of encoding information in more than one way. Whenever possible, make associations with the new material and things you already know. One of the things I like to see in class is when students raise their hand and after a concept is presented and they'll say, is this like whatever? That's fabulous. It helps other students, but the student that can come up with those, and I find that some students are constantly thinking about that. They're constantly taking the information that's presented, particularly in psychology because it's related to so much that we know, and applying it to something that they have seen before uh, or, or are currently witnessing. So make associations with the new material and things you already know. Whenever possible, if you're learning of a, a concept, an idea, try to think of an example, a novel example of that concept. Do you know any of those people who seem to know almost everything? Do you have a friend, family member, aunt or uncle, maybe a parent, that could be on Jeopardy? How did they learn so much? How did they learn so much information? It's amazing. You watch somebody on a show like Jeopardy or some, some trivia show. They, how is it even possible that in their short period of life, 20, 30, 40 years, that they could have learned so much information? Think about the person. Think about the person you know that could most compete on Jeopardy. What is it about that person? What is it about their personality? Invariably, they're hungry for knowledge. They're sponges. They're interested in the world. You know, a lot of us, you know, if somebody teaches, you want to teach you something new, we cross our arms like, okay, do I have to know this? Is this going to be on the test? You know, I mean, that sort of attitude, those aren't the people that are going to know a lot of information. It's the people that are hungry for knowledge. You meet them at a party, you know, they're, this person on Jeopardy meets somebody at a party and uh, they're striking up a conversation. They're often you'll find they're very interesting people to talk to because they're interested in the other person. They can facilitate conversations that way rather than talking about themselves. 